up, guys? Welcome back to another episode of the Bleeding BNG podcast, episode 91. So I guess we can call this our Ryan Kerrigan episode. Getting closer and closer to 100 where these player shout-out episodes are going to be ended. But we have a special episode for you today. Today is Sunday, August the 27th, 2023. The Washington Commanders just wrapped up an undefeated preseason um, where they beat the Cincinnati Bengals 21-19 to in the preseason finale, wrapping up in 3-0. 3-0 preseason, um, the first undefeated preseason in 10 years, in over a decade. Hey, so we're on our way to 20-0. and 0. So if you're checking us out on YouTube, be sure to comment, be sure to like, be sure to subscribe. We're about 80% to 1K. I'm going to go ahead and announce what we're going to be doing for the 1K giveaway on our social media pages tomorrow. I might even drop it on our YouTube community page tomorrow as well. So go ahead and um, check those out um, because once we hit that 1,000 subscriber, um count, you know, we're having um, a really special gift given away um, to a lucky fan in the Washington Commanders community. I know I say this every episode, but you'll see, you'll see once we reveal it tomorrow, I promise you, nobody in the Washington Commanders content creator community is doing this right here. Um, But today, I'm going to give you our final 53-man projection um, for the Washington Commanders. I was going to do a reaction video yesterday, guys, um, going into the game. That was all my intent. I was going to give you two videos. Um, But if you watched that game, which I know most of you guys did, we're pretty tapped in over here um, in the Washington Commanders community. You know that that was one of the most boring um, games that you'll ever see. One of the most boring professional football games that you'll ever see. So we went from maybe the greatest preseason game of all time on Monday against the uh, Baltimore Ravens to playing one of the most boring preseason uh, games of all time yesterday against the Cincinnati Bengals. You know, they say the pros and the Joes and the Jimmies and the Joes. Well, there were a lot of Jimmies out there on those on that field yesterday. Um, and a lot of those Jimmies, I don't think they're going to be making this 53-man roster. Um, they're more likely to be talking to me at the water cooler come next week um but you know shout out to them guys um they put in they put in work you know they fall hard um and you know i wish the best for them going on in their future endeavors but let's get into the guys that are going to make this roster i promise not to hold you guys too long so this is our bleeding b and d final 53 man projection going into the 2023 season cut down day is on tuesday so we're a little less than 48 hours away so in a couple of days we'll see how accurate we were hopefully you guys can revisit this video and be like hey hey bleeding bng jaylee hey you know your you know your stuff over there my boy and if i'm wrong and if i'm completely inaccurate please tell me about that too hey please please let me know if i'm wrong i doubt we ought to I know we are. We, we we write more often than we were wrong over here in Bleeding BNG. But enough of tooting our own horn. Let's get into this roster breakdown. So for this roster breakdown, to come to the accumulation of 53, I have 25 offensive players. I have 25 defensive players. And then I have three specialists. Um, So there's an even um, breakdown amongst the offensive and the defensive players as, much, uh, as far as ratio goes. I think last year the uh, offense kept 26 players. Players. The defense kept 24, uh, and then, you know, the three specialists are, you know, pretty much written in Crown Creek at this point. So I'm going to go with the uh, skill, uh, the offense first. I'm going to start with the skill position players. Um, I'm just going to run down the list and then give you some of the reasons why I went with these guys and why some of the guys in these positions might not have made the final 53-man projection. So for the quarterback, I have a sticking with two quarterbacks, and those quarterbacks are quarterback one, Sam Howe, and Jacoby Brissett. Uh, as you notice, Jake Fromm didn't make this um, 53-man roster. Jake Fromm from State Farm. And, you know, Jake Fromm bought his ass off in the last two preseason games. He had a really good game against the uh, Cincinnati Bengals, following up a really strong comeback performance against the Baltimore Ravens. Um, the simple reason why I think that Jake Fromm wouldn't make this 53-man roster is because I think that we're trying to squeeze on some other um, positions on the roster. And with that three-quarterback rule with um, the third quarterback not necessarily counting against your 53 and being a guy that you can count up, uh, call up at any time before the game, I think you can call him up up until the Saturday before the game. So even after walkthrough, if you think that your quarterback quarterback isn't doing well, um, you can call up that QB3. So I think that Jake's uh, from is a prime candidate for the practice squad. Um, and I think that this is a guy that can be called up at any time. Um, I know a lot of people were saying that, you know, he might be pushing for the QB2 um, with um, some of the way that Jacoby Brissett had been playing over the last couple of games. While I won't go that far, 
I will mention that he does look more comfortable in this Eric Bieniemy offense up until this point. Um, but, guys, we've seen Jake Fromm in the regular season. Just go back to the 2021 season finale when he was a New York Giants quarterback and we played him. And, you know, they were running QB sneaks on third and a mile, right? So that shows you how much faith that they had in Jake Fromm back then. Now, guys can definitely improve. And I think that Jake Fromm has improved, improved. But I think that this is the guy that you can stash on the practice squad with, you know, no impact on the roster um, with, you know, the QB3 situation going on in the NFL nowadays. So uh, two QBs making a 53-man roster coming out of camp is Sam Howell and Jacoby Brissett. I had us going with three running backs. Those three running backs are Chris Rodriguez, Brian Robinson Jr., and Antonio Robinson. So, friend of the show, family friend, Jared Patterson did not make the roster this year, um, kind of like last year. And I'm not even sure that he's going to stick around on the practice squad this year because I think that Jared has shown um, enough capability to make it somewhere on somebody's 53-man roster as a running back. Um, somebody should be giving him a chance because every opportunity that he gets, he's bought out. Um, if you saw his interview with Scott Abraham, I think he's kind of seeing the writing on the wall too, because um, he mentioned that, you know, whether they want me here or not, and I saw that that was a pretty direct shot at, you know, front office or the people over there in roster construction, he mentioned that he felt that he was an NFL player, which I absolutely agree with. You know, I told you guys all too many times before, I've seen this guy run the ball since he was six years old. He's a natural runner, so anything that he's doing at the NFL level does not surprise me. But let's go on to the guys that do, um, that do end up making the roster. Chris Rodriguez, um, he's shown a lot of good vision. Um, he's shown a lot more explosiveness than I anticipated him having um, going into the preseason. Um, he did have that one fumble against the Ravens, um, but you see this is the guy that Eric Bieniemy clearly likes. And he, he showed some juice in the preseason in all three games. I think he was the leading rusher in all three games. Um, so this is a guy that shows some promise, um, and he can kind of relieve Brian Robinson in those early down roles um, as that tough, hard-nosed runner. Um, you know, Brian Robinson has said in multiple interviews um, that, you know, his legs and his body kind of gave around at the end of the season last year, specifically in that San Francisco 49er game where I think he was shut down after that. Um, and a lot of that had to do with the fact that he was shot a couple of weeks going into the season. I think that it's a year ago this weekend um, that Brian Robinson was shot in an unfortunate incident. But I think that, you know, not only was he shot, but he was taking a lot of hits. You know, Brian Robinson isn't going to go down in first contact. So if you can go back to last year, you remember he was he was giving his shoulder to, to six dudes on one play. And I think that those hits started to build up. So a guy like Chris Rodriguez can, you know, give him some relief on those early downs, reprieve him on those early downs. And then you have Antonio Gibson, who can not only run in between the task in the tackles, but he's also going to be your third down running back this year as well with that receiving background. Um, he showed it with his touchdown um, against the Baltimore Ravens. Not only did he show the receiving prowess running a tremendous choice route, but then he showed that, you know, toughness and that physicality um, as a 230-pound running back dipping his shoulder and getting into the end zone. So Chris Rodriguez, Brian Robinson Jr., and Antonio Gibson are our three running backs making a 53-man roster. At tight end, I have four tight ends making it. Um, technically, unless you want to count this last guy as a fullback. So, if uh, hypothetically, you can count this guy in the tight end group or the running back room. Um, but our tight ends are Logan Thomas, Cole Turner, John Bates, and Alex Armour. Um, I don't think that anybody has benefited from the Eric Bieniemy system more than um, Alex Armour. This is a guy that can give you that positional flex, not only blocking in line as a tight end. It's something that he's been doing and showing throughout camp. But his, his natural position is fullback. And if we can go back to a couple of years ago with the Kansas City Chiefs, they used the fullback in Mark, Michael Burton, somebody that was on this roster for a hot second. But Eric Bieniemy is somebody that has shown um, the adeptness to you know use a fullback at times, and I think that Alex Armour is the beneficiary of that, you know, ideology and that offensive philosophy. Um, I would have loved to see him get in that end zone on that two-point conversion, I believe, or um, on the goal line against the Baltimore Ravens. But this is a guy that has provided positional versatility. Um, he was in Carolina, so, you know, he has those, you know, those down south commander, what 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 we call uh, Carolina again? Washington South. He has those commander south ties with the Rivers and with um, the Martys and things like that. And this is a guy that has been balling out all camp. And I think that the the injury to Armani Rogers um, has also opened up the door for Alex Armour as well. Um, this is a guy that can um, be you know a physical 
um, guy with the ball in his hands. He can move the chains um, and also be an impact blocker in run situations um, and, you know, be a positional flex type of player. And then the other three tight ends, I think those guys are pretty much set in stone. John Bates is the best inline blocker on this roster. Um, he's the best. He's one of the best inline blocking tight ends in the NFL. I just need him to catch the ball, John. I just need you to catch the ball because you do whatever you do your job really well. I just need you to catch the ball because that's a part of your job description as well. Um, Logan Thomas, I think that he's safe on the roster, even though his lower leg is made out of pulled brisket. Um, this is a guy who's experienced. Um, I think he even told my man Rio Robinson out on the field yesterday. He's like, I'm gonna be work. I'm gonna be ready for week one. So hopefully he's not just blowing smoke up our ass. Um, but this is a guy who I'm, I've been a Logan Thomas advocate. You guys know if you're a real bleeding BNG follower, we've been Logan Thomas guys, uh, especially when he's healthy because he's a smart player uh, playing that, uh, he, you know, him being a former quarterback. He's a guy that, you know, can pick out zones, can sit in zones. Um, and he's a big baddie that can beat man coverage as well, just simply with his sheer size and, you know, athletic ability that he had prior to these leg injuries. And he's somebody that was dominating early in camp. Um, so if we can get him back on track with who I think is tight end one right now and Cole Turner, who has shown prowess as an inline blocker, something that we would have never said coming out of the University of Nevada. Um, and, you know, he's been making catches. I think he's had a catch in every preseason game. So I think Cole Turner is tight end one on this roster. So if we can get Logan Thomas healthy as well, I think that they can form a pretty formidable um, tight end room. Uh, so those are the four tight ends making that 53-man roster. On to our wide receivers. I have six wide receivers making the roster, making the 53-man um, projection coming out of camp. And those six wide receivers are wide receiver Terry McLaurin, wide receiver Jahan Dotson, wide receiver Curtis Samuel, wide receiver De'Ami Brown, wide receiver Byron Pringle, and Dax Mill. Now, if you would have asked me this, if we recorded this episode 24 hours ago, I would have told you Dax Mill was not on this list. Dax Mill's name would have been replaced with Kaz Allen. But boy, let me tell you, and I know you guys watch, Kaz Allen spoiled himself. He spoiled himself on a job interview um, as bad as anybody that could recently remember. And I'm sure that there's other examples in the NFL, but you know, we locked in over here with the commanders. Uh, let me put this in a real world sense, a real life world sense. You know, Curtis, uh, I mean, Kaz Allen, his was similar to, you know, you going on your first job interview and you spilling steaming hot coffee on your boss or the guy interviewing you or the guy potentially giving you the job. That's what Kaz Island did yesterday in the preseason finale. And this is a guy that I'm an advocate for because he's a dynamo with the ball in his hands. But you got to get the ball in your hands, sir. He had two drops. He had a muff pump that he did recover. But this is a coaching staff that's, that has said... Like, they don't care about that, the flash and the action and, and the glitz and the glamour once you get the ball. They want you to secure it first. Ball possession is the biggest thing to Ron Rivera and his archaic-ass coaching style, right? So this is – and this isn't something that I would necessarily do, but I think that this is why the coaching staff is going to go ahead and go with a guy like Dax Mill um, as wide receiver six on the roster. Dax had a drop yesterday, but this is a guy that knows the playbook. He can line up in multiple receiver um, positions. Now, I'm not saying that he does it well, but he can go be a decoy just simply because he knows where to line up and what route to run at that position, right? And that's that's valuable because simply being a decoy and getting out the way can, can open up um, space for the offense and things like that. Um, so I think that Kaz Allen is a prime candidate for the practice squad, even though I think that he has the type of dynamic ability with the ball in his hands that a team might, you know, Pitch him off the waiver wire, and he might not get to the practice squad. But I think that, you know, with our old school coaching staff, I think that they're going to go ahead and give it to a shorthanded guy like Dax Mill, who has no juice after the catch. I think that I'm faster than Dax Mills. Dead ass, though. You think I'm joking, but I'm dead ass, though. I think I might be faster than Dax Mills. Somebody tell me, and somebody, somebody tell Dax Mills, set up the race. Set up the race. Meet me in the uh, FedEx Field parking lot for that race. But let's move on to our offensive linemen. I have us keeping, um, and other than that, you know, the rest of the wide receivers, they're dogs. They're dogs. They're, they're everybody else, Byron Pringle, De'Ami Brown, their names are solidified. I don't think I got to go too much into them. Um, let's go on to this offensive line, though. I have us keeping 10 offensive linemen. Um, and I think that this is one of the, you know, as I mentioned with the quarterbacks, this is where they were going to try to squeeze 
um, some gas um, and look to keep some gas um, because, quite honestly, a couple of these guys that I've named, I'm not sure if I would have kept them if I was the GM because they haven't really shown me anything during training camp and the preseason. But this is a, a regime, a front office regime that has shown to stick by their draft picks. So let me go ahead and get into the list before I bury the lead. Offensive lineman, we have Charles Leno. We have guard, Sadiq Charles. We have center, Nick Gates. We have guard, Sam Cosme. We have tackle, Andrew Wiley. We have tackle, Cornelius Lucas. We have guard, Chris Paul. We have guard, center, Ricky Stromberg. Guard, tackle, Braden Daniels. And guard, tackle, Mason Brooks, who's an undrafted free agent out of Old Miss. Um, as you see... Um, Tyler Larson was omitted from this list, and I think that's due to the rise of Ricky Stromberg over the last couple of weeks of camp. If you guys have uh, noticed in the last couple of preseason games, and if you have paid attention to any of the training camp news and notes, um, Ricky Stromberg has been filling in at guard, um, meeting that positional flex, that positional versatility that you know this front office is such an advocate for, and he's been doing pretty well. I think that he moved really well in the um, Baltimore Raven game. Um, blowing guys off the ball. He showed some um, foundational strength that I didn't necessarily think that he had in the run game. That was the one of the reasons why I didn't necessarily think that he can um, play guard because uh, I didn't think that he had, you know, the lower body strength and, you know, constantly blow dudes up down in and down out. You know, as a center, you're picking up a lot of double team blocks. You're helping up. You're cleaning up, up a lot of trash. What I thought that he did really well at. But he's been a pleasant surprise at guard. Um but then another guy I want to mention um, is Mason Brooks. And I think that Mason Brooks has made this team simply because of his positional versatility as well. This is a guy that made his name a couple of um, days in the camp, early in the camp. I think that he had a one-on-one -on -one session where he held his own against Deron Payne. And that put the coaching staff on notice. Um, and if we can remember, this is a guy coming out of Western Kentucky that was high up on draft boards. Now, he didn't have the season that he had hoped to have at Ole Miss, but he's 6'6", 320 pounds. And as I mentioned before, he can play the right tackle position. And if you looked yesterday, go back and look at the film yesterday, guys. Mason Brooks was blowing motherfuckers off the ball left and right. Left and right. And then he even got in a scrap with, the, with old buddy that hit Jake Fromm on the sideline. That's what I want in my lineman. I think the scrap is what gave him the edge over Tyler Larson for me. I want my lineman that's going to get nitty gritty and, 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 and down and shitty and, and, and get into it. I want my lineman that's going to get into the shits. I want my lineman with all the spoke. If you peeped our reaction video, I told you what I wanted in my quarterback. Sam gave it to me what I wanted in my quarterback throwing up the gang signs. Well, I want my right guard throwing motherfuckers on the sideline like Mason Brooks, was, like Mason Brooks did in a meaningless preseason game, right? Mason Brooks, you made the roster after that, Mason Brooks. Congratulations. Congratulations. Trent Scott, Tyler Lawson, maybe you guys want to scrap a little bit more. Maybe you guys need to scrap a little bit more. Because I, I, I'm going to rock with Mason Brooks. Uh, not only because he's a scrapper, um, not only because he's a mauler, but as I mentioned before, he has the physical prowess. Um, at Western Kentucky, this is a guy who was in a lot of Top 10 offensive uh, tackle ratings um, going into the 2022 college season. Um, and as I mentioned, he didn't have the season that he wanted to have at Ole Miss. Um, but I think that, you know, this is a nice piece of clay that the offensive line, you know, Travell Wharton and Juan Castillo can mow. Uh, and I think that this is a guy that you don't let get to the waiver wire because the team is going to pick him up in a heartbeat. Because other teams, though. Other teams knew about Mason Brooks going into the 2022 season. So to see him on the wa on the waiver wire will be the slim pickings, right? Slim pickings. They're going to pick him up in a heartbeat. So that's it for the offense. That's our 25 players for the offense. We had 10 offensive linemen, six wide receivers, four tight ends, three running backs, and two quarterbacks. Moving on <coughs> excuse me, to the defense, where I had 25 players as well. I had 11 players in the trenches. I just put defensive line because I think that we have a lot of pieces um, that are versatile. We have a lot of guys that can play the defensive end position as well as the three-tech, the five-tech, and the interior, um, you know, pass rushing position and things like that. <coughs> Excuse me. So, the 10 defensive linemen that I went with are defensive end, Chase Young, Jonathan Allen, Deron Payne, Montez Sweat, F.A. Obata. Defensive tackle, John Ridgway. Defensive ends, Andre Jones Jr., K.J. Henry, Casey Hill, Casey Tuhill, excuse me, James Smith-Williams, and then defensive tackle for Darian Mathis. Guys, 
I'm going to say this now. Don't be surprised if Fedarian Mathis ends up on IR. But for the sake of this video, for the sake of this projection, I'm going to go ahead and have him on the 53-man roster. You guys attacked me two weeks ago when I said that the clock is ticking on Fedarian Mathis. Well, guess what? Me and him have had the same amount of practice time since then. Zero. Zero. So I just want your apology to be as loud as the disrespect. I hope that Fedarian Mathis comes out and be uh, and is a baller. But ever since I made that tweet, buddy been in the walking boot ever since, right? So, you know, this is a guy that might sneak on the PUP, um, the pup list, or, um, you know, the injured reserve, allowing another guy to make the roster, maybe a potato or Amir Abdullah, because I think that a lot of the D linemen have impressed the coaches. Um, but going back to, like, Jake Fromm mentioning only keeping two quarterbacks, this is where, you know, as I mentioned with Brandon da uh, Daniels in the offensive line, I don't think that the um, the front office and the regime is going to admit their mistake in K.J. Henry. K.J. Henry actually had a pretty um, decent pass rush move from the interior last um, light against the Cincinnati Bengals. But that was the first thing I saw from K.J. Henry all summer camp, right? All training camp, all OTAs, and you know, your boy out there, boots on the ground. That's the first time I noticed K.J. Henry on the football field. And I think that they're just going to give him time. I think that Andre Jones Jr. is clearly the best rookie defensive end on the roster. I think that he's a roster lock. I think that he's um, a guy that has the capability of playing special teams over a guy like K.J. Henry with his background playing linebacker um, in college at the University of Louisiana Lafayette. So he's used to running up and down the field. He has that athletic prowess to be able to play, you know, a lot of special team coverage units. And that gives him the edge over K.J. Henry, let alone him just being the, the pass rusher with the most twitch and the most juice shown to this point. But I think that, you know, we skimped over on the quarterbacks to allow guys like Braden Daniels and K.J. Henry to allow them to buy some time uh, to allow these guys to develop um, because, as we've seen, this front office has just stuck by their guys. Um, whether that be a good thing, whether that be a bad thing, that's what they do. They stick by their guys. They don't admit their mistakes. Well, not after the first year, at least. Uh, and I think that that's what they're going to do with K.J. Henry. But other than that, I think that the top of the defensive line is pretty much solidified. That's the best position group on the team. Um, Chase Stingerboy Young. Um, if he ever decides that he wants to play for the Washington Commanders again, I think he'll be a starting in alongside Monte Sweat with the two best defensive players on the team in them Bama boys, the Alabama Wall, Jonathan Allen, Deron Payne. I think that F.A. Obata is a guy that can play the defensive end and the interior pass rush. He's a guy that showed a lot of interior pass rush prowess, I think, in the first game against the Cleveland Browns. I think that Jay Smith-Williams um, provides the same, same skill set as a guy that can play the defensive end role as well as be an interior pass rusher. And K.J. Henry um, rushed from the interior as well. So those guys kind of have redundant, um, redundant skill sets. Um, and if there was um, a reason why the coaching staff would only go with 10 linemen, I think that those one of those guys would be um, the cut, either K.J. Henry or James Smith-Williams, just due to their redundant skill set, skill set. But I told you before, I'm a James Smith-Williams guy. This is a good depth piece. Good depth piece. He always shows up when it's uh, called upon. And, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm an advocate for seventh rounders that uh, play higher than that seventh round value. I'm not letting go of Casey Tuhill, um, as I mentioned before. I love what Casey Tuhill um, presents as a drop defender. And this is, you know, what we need with somebody like Jack Del Rio, who is a decent coordinator, but he doesn't have the most exotic blitz scheme. He sends a lot of four at a time. Um, so when he does have those exotic blitz schemes, um, where he's sending extra guys. You need a guy like Casey, Casey Tuhill, who's a defensive lineman who can drop back in coverage, read the quarterback's eyes. You can look, Casey Tuhill's had a, a, a number of pass deflections, and they use Casey Tuhill to, to be a quarterback spy in a couple of games. I even remember either 2022 or 2021, they had him spying Jalen Hurts. So he has the athletic ability, and I think that his skill set is a little different from the Obadas, the K.J. Henrys, the James Smith-Williams, and I think that that's why his roster spot is pretty much safe. But we have 11 guys on the D-line. Now, going on to the position that the coaching staff clearly seems to not give a shit about, and it's kind of surprising because this coaching staff is led by two linebackers, and that's the linebacker position where I only have us keeping four. Those four are Jamin Davis. Khalid Hudson, Cody Barton, and David Mayo. Yes, I have the Mayo man making it again. I know you guys hate to hear that. 
I know you guys are Milo Eifer guys, the John Scooter Harris guys. Well, guess what, guys? If you've been paying attention to, to the preseason, David Mayo is making his team. David Mayo plays on every special team unit, guys. David Mayo is making his team. I don't know what to tell you. Now, let's hope and pray he doesn't have to play in any regular game action, non-special teams. Let's hope he doesn't have to play on first through third downs. But they love David Mayo. And if you're out in training camp, you know that David Mayo is probably the leader in that room. He leads all the linebacker, uh, you know, breakdowns in and out of, you know, tra uh, practice sessions and things like that. And this is a guy that is clearly has the respect of the guys on the team, even though he might not have the respect of the guys in the Washington Commander community. David Mayo's making his team. As much as it might pain me to say that, guys, David Mayo's making his team. I think that we're going to run a lot of one and two linebacker sets, and that's where, you know, Cody Barton and Jamin Davis come into play. And then I think when you're going to go with our typical 4-3 defense, a guy like Khalid Hudson is going to, going to come in and be that weak side off the ball linebacker attacking the edges, attacking the backside of runs like he did last night against the Cincinnati Bengals. So those are our four running backs. And then to round out the offense and the defense, I have us keeping 10 defensive backs. I just went with defensive backs because you don't know where these dudes are going to be playing this season. I'm excited to see what they have up their, up their sleeves with the defensive backs. Um, because like I said, we have so much positional versatility, positional flex. We got a couple of guys that can play corner and safety at the NFL level, right? So I just went with DB. I just named them DBs, and here are the 10 DBs that I have making the roster. Emmanuel Forbes, he's strictly a corner. Benjamin St. Juice, he can play outside or in the slot. Kendall Fuller can play outside in the slot. Danny Johnson's more like a nickel corner. I think that Christian Holmes is more so a boundary corner, even though he's built like a fucking outside linebacker. And then we have Cam Curl, who can play all over the field. I call him the uh, the, the king, the queen. Well, my, my, chest, my chest friends, please tell me. What's the, what's the piece that you can move all over? It's the queen, right? I know you might not hate that name. I know you might hate that name, Cam, Cam but it's it's some deep meaning behind that. It's some deep meaning behind that. And if you allow me to explain it, I guarantee you fuck with the name after I give it to you. <laughs> and then I have Derek Forrest. I have Percy Butler, Jartavius Martin, and Jeremy Reeves rounding out, um, you know, the final 50, excluding the specialists. Um, as I mentioned before, I think that we only keep five corners because a guy like Jartavius Martin, even though he was drafted as a safety, um, he can fill in in a pinch at a boundary corner, at a slot corner, despite his struggles. He's shown you that he can do that. Now, is he capable of doing that at an elite level? No. So that's why he might be cornerback number six on the depth chart and then safety number three or three or four on, on the depth chart. That's the positional versatility that had him rising up draft boards and had us selecting him in the second round over an offensive lineman, even though everybody and their mother knew we desperately needed one. I think that Quan Martin's going to be another ch uh, chess piece quasi Cam Curl. He's going to be a baby Cam Curl this year, right? And I think that we're going to see Cam playing a lot in the post this year um just, we're gonna have a lot of moving parts in the defense i think that emmanuel forbes um is pretty much solidified at that left cornerback um slot um i think he's gonna stay on that left side a la richard sherman in his prime i think that that's just where he feels comfortable at that's where he's making breaks if you've seen that's what benjamin st juice played a lot at last year but Starting at the beginning of the training camp, they're like, nah, St. Juice, you're you going to play in the middle, you're going to play on this right. That side is allocated over to uh, Manny Forbes. So they're over there giving him that first-round draft pick treatment. So I just need him to live, live up to the hype. Um, but as I mentioned before, I think that this is a huge year for Percy Butler. I think that he has um, the capability of playing in the post. I think that he can play the strong safety role, and I think that he can play the big nickel role. And he's faster than any guy that I mentioned uh, in the safety room. He's the fastest safety on the roster who I think has the most range. Um, you've seen he had an uh, interception against the Cleveland Browns in week one of the preseason, and he had a plethora of interceptions throughout training camp, um, picking off not only Jake Fromm and Jacoby Brissett, but he had a number of interceptions um, against Sam Howe. So that told you that he was running with the ones. So if you can get that 4-3-4 speed that Percy, Har um, Percy Butler ran at the 40, if you can get that coming down, think about when he um, ran down Ezekiel Elliott in the last game of the regular season last year. So if you can have that around the box, and not only in the box, in the, uh, um, in the post as well, and move him all over the field because you have a number of versatile other DBs, 
uh, the sky's the limit for this defense. Um, so that'll wrap it up for our 10 DVs. And then our three uh, specialists are pretty much etched in stone. Our partner, Tressway, one of the best players on the team. The legend. The legend, Tressway. Our kicker, Swole Joey Slap, who's had a hell of a preseason. Um, and then our snapper, long, um, our long snapper, Cameron Cheeseman, who needs to get his shit together. All that new practice, snapping techniques and all that, I'm going to need you to figure that out by September 10th, bro. Because truth be told, you might have caused Dustin Hopkins' his job in 2021 with those snaps. But, you know, you're still here. Joey, Joey Sly and Trash Wade, they're having hell of a preseason. They're having hell of a preseason. They're having hell of all seasons. I'm going to need you to get it together. Because that special teams unit was really good last year, and I don't I don't need you messing it up this year. I don't. I don't. So that'll do it for our 53-man projection. Uh, 25 offensive players, 25 defensive players, three specialists. Let me know how we did. Let us know how we did. Uh, let me know if you agree. Let me know if you disagree. Leave the comment. Be Like I've said before, like, comment, subscribe. Let us know who you think are going to make the roster. And as I said, on Tuesday when that final 53-man roster is finalized, come back to the video. Let us know how we did. Talk your shit. Congratulate us if we need congratulations. Get on us. Join on us if we need to be joined on. Um, but... As always, thank you guys for tuning in to another episode of the Bleed and BNG podcast. Um, if you haven't already, be sure to tap into those social media pages because I'm giving out that 1K subscriber giveaway over there um, tomorrow. Our Instagram is at Bleed and BNG. That's B L E E D I N G B N G. Our Twitter is at Bleed and BNG. That's B L E E D I N B N G. Oh, matter of fact, our X, excuse me, it's X now, but there's only one G in our X handle. That's a lot of that's a lot of alphabet soup going on. Our X handle is B L E E D I N B N G. So there's only one G in our X handle. If you're listening to us on audio only platforms as such as Spotify, as Apple Podcasts, as Odyssey, be sure to leave a rating. Be sure to leave a review. That's how we finesse these algorithms so that when you're looking up anything Washington Commanders, Bleeding B N G is that number one content hub that pops up in your search bar. Thank you guys for tuning into this episode. Hopefully you enjoyed it. Football season is here. I got a lot of content coming out between now and September 10th, so be sure to be tapped into the page, and I'll check in on you guys later.